This is Richard Caruso, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. A couple old veterans talking some, couple, you know, couple really old school guys. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to jump right in because um, right behind you is a great, uh, I loved the movie Felon that kind of tells your story. And I guess we could talk about a variety of things, but you worked as a correction officer at least for a while in, in California. And I thought we might just start there and then start about the, you know, we, we've got a lot of problems with our correction system in this country, partly because we incarcerate entirely too many people. They tend to be black dudes more than anybody else, and it's just out of whack. And then once you get there, we're not getting what we want out of that system. And I think everybody agrees with that. We're always trying to improve the correction system. We've, we've taken a hard look at policing in the last couple of years, but, boy, corrections, it's tough. And, and I'll just say this. Dude, I talked to a corrections officer when I was working on my prison chronicles, and one of the things she said, she was in Alabama, she's like, look, Toyota comes down here. I can't compete with them. You know, I'm struggling to get dudes that are at least eight and hit the gate. And That's Toyota right. comes along and offers better everything, wages, better job, better livelihood, less risk. Like, she's like, I, I, you know, I'm struggling just to keep anybody. And the other thing she said that was really interesting, and then I'm going to shut up and let you talk, was she's like, when I show up at work as a supervisor, I already have 10 hours of work for my eight-hour day, and I never get to that stuff because the moment I get there, everything changes. Right. Well, I, I know out in California when I started uh, in 1987, um, that was the biggest fear out there because it was a prison boom and uh, that private companies like Nabisco, Toyota, they were to come in and that inmate that cost $80 a day to house, they were going to house them at $45, $50 a day and basically pay that officer, you know, mid-range salaries compared to where we were making higher range salaries and uh, do a very, you know, a lot more cost effective. And that was a big fear of our union is that, you know, the pitch that our union gave is, do you want Walmart cops uh, guarding these inmates? Because that's what you're going to get. So what happens, uh, when, what happens when that happens? <laughs> well, I mean, the training is not as good. I mean, you look at, uh, the TSA program after 9-11 and the screening program in the airports. And right now, you know, I mean, the billions of dollars that the government has invested in uh, TSA, um, some of it I'm for, some of it I'm against, but, you know, you are getting a better screening process getting on that plane. Uh, I think people feel more secure. And I, and I think that's a big uh, thing with uh, the public is, uh, making them feel secure. And if you pump fear in the public, uh, it's a very effective tool to get any wage that you want. If you, you know, and, and in California, that's what, that's what the union did a lot is, you know, they were basically saying, you don't want these murderers and rapists climbing over the walls of the prison into your neighborhood. So you need to pay us this much and we'll prevent that. So as a citizen in any community, you're going to say, Hey, pay these guys, whatever you got to pay. And, um, Popping fear into the public from a military standpoint, um, any kind of uh, standpoint that's going to jeopardize the safety and security of any kind of city or country, it's a very effective tool to get the wages or the uh, monies that are needed. And then that system also is feathered by uh, sheriffs ha being elected. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't elect sheriffs, but when sheriffs get elected, you know, they tend to be, I'm tough on crime. And the DA says, I'm tough on crime. And these guys run on being tough on crime. You got this. I remember when the uh, the prison in Corcoran opened. And they're like, this is the newest state of the art, highest, uh, you know, That's right. highest, uh, modern, hardest to escape prison. And literally the day they opened it, a guy busted out. You know, it's like stuff. And so that turns into even more money. And you don't have a high state of the art, high capacity, uh, hard to escape prison in the middle of the Central Valley if... Um, and, and then not put people in it. You know, no one's like, hey, we got to close prisons. Everybody's being nice. Well, we had 6,000 inmates at Corcoran when I was there, right around 5,800 to 6,000. Now, imagine that. And then you got three or four other prisons around Corcoran and out surrounding towns. You got Delano, you got Avenal, you got Wasco. Um, so imagine, I mean, the whole area down there. In those communities are being fed by the California Department of Corrections. 
So, I mean, it's, it's a huge business. And part of the problem is, uh, you know, prison is not a deterrent to these young gang members that are coming out of the hood. You know, it's, it's more like a, more like a military camp or a summer camp. They can hang out with their homeboys in their neighborhood. There's more violence. There's more threat of being killed than inside prison. And, um, but when you're housing nonviolent drug offenders and you got maximum and mandatory sentences that go along with, uh, you know, the amount of drugs that are found on somebody and they're going to get a mandatory sentence. That's what's filling up our prisons, both federally and in state prisons. And, and, uh, I just believe that you need to find an alternative to someone who's got a drug problem and, uh, you know, throwing them in prison with, uh, uh, you know, warehousing them for 20 years. That's not the answer. One of the things I learned in the prison chronicles was that most of these guys, these guys for the most part had committed murder or had three felony strikes against them. But they uh, basically all said, I never met a true murderer. Yes. I met people that killed people, but someone that like we might call criminally insane. They're like, I just didn't meet those guys. Not that they don't exist, but you know, Charles Manson obviously falls into that category, but they said the bulk of the people that were there had had, multiple problems stack up and it turned into this thing where they had committed murder, you know, not to justify that crime, but these right. weren't, these weren't psychopaths or sociopaths. Well, I, you know, a lot of it, the, I, I believe the breakdown of the two parent home, having that positive male role model in the home is a recipe for disaster for a young male that's walking through a gang infested neighborhood and has all his homeboys that he's got to walk through and not be a part of that game for some kind of protection. When dad is not home leading by example and setting the standard of discipline, how come I can give that same gang member when I have him in prison structure, tell him to tuck his shirt in, make his rat, do this, do that. And he's answering me. Yes, officer. Yes, officer. He's gravitating towards that structure. Many times I felt that, if he had that structure in the home, he might not be, he might not be in prison. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I mean, we've looked at this, this topic a lot. The, we had the guys from the, what, what's they used to be called, um, uh, what is it? I can't remember. Devon Bogan's the guy's name. And they worked in the city of Richmond trying to reduce the crime there and the bad area. Yeah. yeah. And they took the to top 25 shitheads that they could find. And they're like, Hey, We've all left you behind. We apologize. We want to offer you something different. And the, um, the, the program is now called Advanced Peace. But what they would do is they would run these guys through a case management program. It involved mentors. It involved getting them through like, hey, you have anger management problems. You have drug problems. Let's work you through this thing. Along the way, you get a stipend if you're doing the right things and, and you get compensated for that. And they had a lot of success, but part of what they did was they, they created basically uncles and, and they said, yeah. hey, there's accountability. I expect you to fail. I expect you to miss an appointment for your anger management class. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to come down. I'm going to see you. I'm going to love you. And we're going to get to that meeting the next time. We're just going to, you may quit, but I'm not going to quit on you. And that, that made a world of difference for their ability to take some of the worst people Richmond could find and get them for the statistically overall predominantly off the streets and become viable citizens again. Well, I mean, you know, it's all about choices and consequences. And, you know, my experience dealing with young males, they want that structure. They want to have uh, consequences if they mess up. And if you look at the, look at them at the, at the um, high school and, the, and the, the coaches, the mentors that are coaches to these young males that they, they get, they make consequences if they mess up for practice or if they miss practice or school. And if dad is not home giving them consequences, that young kid is gravitating towards a teacher or a coach or some male in that community, a yeah. preacher and uh, having that strong male positive role model in the home Mom, mom can't do both roles. You know, lots of lots of mothers are working two, three jobs, or you have mothers that are having kids by three, four different guys, and are strung out on dope. And if there's not a good example in the home, 
that it's a recipe for disaster. And, and that's a proven fact, not just in California. But uh, I remember going through the police academy out in Napa, right down the street from you, and um, at Napa Valley College. And when you talk about Richmond, our president in our academy, he was a cadet that was busted for selling cocaine in Richmond as a juvenile. And they hired, uh, hired him on Richmond to be a police officer. And I was stunned at that, that out of the selection process, you're hiring someone that was arrested for selling cocaine as a juvenile, but that's yeah. because rich men and, you know, people don't know about the crest. I know you know about the crest. Sure. They, people do not go up in there. I mean, police officers don't go up there unless they're too deep because it's a very dangerous area. Yeah, there's not a lot of uh, respect for authority there because the authorities honestly have failed them in so many ways, right? Like the the way you survive out there is being from there. We had uh, Shaka Sungur on the show, and he talked about he was in he was in solitary for the bulk of his 20 plus year uh, time in, in confinement, and he went on tours worldwide after he wrote some really compelling books. And one of the things he found out in Germany, the the warden he was talking to said like we would never do that to another citizen you know and they they looked at the value of the person and as a citizen and worked from that premise as opposed to a more punitive base which was sort of what we 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 struggle between punitive and rehabilitation right we can't seem to get that balance right there's no i mean there's very rehabilitation i know in the california prison system but i'm going to ask you this question what is the most dangerous weapon what do you feel is the most dangerous weapon? Like a tactical in your hand weapon or just the human mind? Well, the, from my experience, the most dangerous weapon is a man that doesn't have hope, sure. that doesn't value his life, yeah. and doesn't fear consequences. Right. And if you take a man's hope away and he and he doesn't care what the consequences are, he's, he's a loaded weapon walking the streets. So how, yeah, how about if that person when, believes that they crave consequences? You know, well, I know just you know, in the, from where you live, and you see it all the time when you go out in the public. You go to Vallejo, you go yeah. to Benicia, you'll see these young kids, and you can see them starting to come up. Some of them will mirror the gang banging, and you look at them like he's heading for a dead end. Yeah. But if 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 one of them. Um, Gra gravitates towards a male role model in their community, that positive male role models, someone that may be in the ROTC program or in athletics or in some program in school, they'll latch on to that male like their father. And, and I've seen them in the military. I mean, um, you know, you get these young kids out of the city that go in the military and the success rate is so, is so high because what's the military do? It gives them structure. It gives them discipline. It gives them consequences. Sure. And um, I think that's what we're lacking in today's in, in today's homes is that, you know, that positive male role model setting the example, treating his wife and their mother with respect. And um, I mean, I've had father and son cellmates. You know, there's something wrong there. If uh, yeah. if dad's not calling home and saying, son, you don't want to follow my path. You know, this is a bad place. You don't want to come here. When you yeah. got father, when you got father and son cellmates, that's that's pretty sad uh, scenario for uh, our judicial system. And not something that we want as citizens. I don't. I don't no. know. That, that's not the outcome I want. One of the things we also learned from the uh, prison chronicles was that the um, prison was an extension of the community in Detroit, where Shaka Sangura was, or um, X-rated this rapper who was from Sacramento, and and. Our lives just about overlapped because his community was in uh, the south part of Sacramento where I worked at Tower Records, right? And he came to the Tower Records store I worked at a few years after I worked there because it was yeah. his birthday. And he was going to, you know, so we had, and, and he's maybe five years younger than me, right? And so I'm in the area. I, I was across the street from the mall. That I, they're like, hey, don't go to that mall. It's too many right. gang people in there. And he's right. talking about, and you know this as a Marine. He's like, when we went to the mall, and this came through over and over again as I talked to these dudes. He's like, when we went to the mall, we had basically an operations order. We were briefed on what to do if we saw so-and-so or this group, you know, and you had to think about, like, 
I was going to go in this door, go down here, buy my shoes and get out. So I wouldn't get targeted for something. And I'm like, you're describing a uh, combat patrol. And he's right. like, that's what it felt like. Right. right, and, these, right. and these guys, uh, the other thing I realized was that the, not only is there a life like combat, you know, like there are X's to get off of everywhere, but they also get PTSD from all of that. But let, let me, let me stop you there. Cause you're exactly yeah. right. Think of their mindset compared yeah. to that white guy who's basically doesn't have that fight or flight mindset that that black male and i'm not trying to say you know i'm not trying to get off on that tangent but that black male's mindset a lot is in fight or flight mm -hmm. he's feeling he's already being profiled and in many cases he is yeah yeah by his own people or or by anybody else there is right. there is danger all around him which we know has this uh, parasympathetic response which leads to things like cortisol and adrenaline coming in. And, and we know through veterans, we've learned a lot about like, this becomes how you operate. I know for me, my PTSD, it for sure is part of like my response to things, it's a lot more manageable now, but I have to manage it. It's like, I have, I have to go to the gym every day for my brain. I've got to do these things. Right. So if you grow in, uh, if you grow up in an area where you don't have uh, positive adult influences, you have a mom, God bless, doing her best, you know, but there's just not enough mom to go around. And you don't have something like the VA studying, trying to help figure these things out and provide care. All of a sudden, you know, you'll have your own devices and, and nobody cares about you. So you just like veterans, you know, you, nobody cares about me. I believe you. And so I don't care about me either. And then you make those kind of decisions and the humanity is is ripped out of these people. It's so it's so ironic where you live, because I know the area like the back yeah. of my hand. And That's um, when I, from. I live in Orange County now, but same thing applies down here. There's right. Yeah. When, when I was uh, up in uh, Vallejo and Napa and um, I had exposed a uh, Corker State Prison, you know, I had just been on 60 Minutes. The case was big in all the newspapers out there, San Francisco Chronicle, Los Angeles Times, front page news. And um, I would go into Gold's Gym in Vallejo and when I throw these names at you, I mean, Selly Sell from uh, yeah. Vallejo. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they were all watching my back. Hell's Angels. Hell's right. Angels out of Vallejo. They were all like, hey, nothing's going to happen to this guy that's trying to stop this violence. And right. um, for me, it was uh, I was going to end up killing somebody and getting away with it to be part of that rogue crew. And... Uh, they were pressuring me saying that I feared doing it. And uh, what I feared was meeting my maker someday, knowing that I took another man's life that didn't have it coming. I had no problem shooting another person to protect somebody, but yeah. I'm not going to create, I'm not going to create the wreck and put these two enemies out there on the yard, like what was happening just to fit in and shoot somebody. And uh, when I saw it was happening, I went up my chain of command to stop it. And my chain, of, my chain of command basically told me, you know what, keep your mouth shut. So that's when I started stealing stuff out of the prison and funneling it to my house in uh, Hanford. And then I went to the FBI and started stealing stuff from the FBI to expose the corruption that was happening and the violence inside America's deadliest prison corporate. But um, yeah, let me let me before we get fully into this, too, I want to describe this, too. When I was doing my work trying to put this prison chronicles thing together. I could not find a active corrections officer, even outside of the state of California, that would talk to me. And they said, not a chance. It's, it'll cost me my career. I, yeah. talked to, I tried to reach out to the public affairs officers. Nope, nothing. And I wasn't doing, I'm not 60 minutes. I'm just some dude who asks good questions. They don't know who I am. They wouldn't right. even take the meeting, right? And so like right. that tells me that, hey, you guys have an accountability and, and visibility problem. If you you can't talk, I mean, you can lie to me. You can tell me whatever you wanted to tell me, but but they fe they all feared the the reprisal of being open about what happened in the correction system. Well, I mean, for me, I was part of that inner core that was exposed to so much violence on a daily basis, used and abused. So, for me to come out and expose it, they were just like, "Holy shit!" You know, one of our one of our guys, you know, they knew what I said was the truth and uh, they feared what I knew. And um, 
luckily, you know, when you, when you become a whistleblower, um, for me, for someone to report misconduct, if you get your hand caught in the cookie jar and you go tell on your buddies, to me, you're a rat. Okay. That's a rat. If you if you're trying to save lives, you're trying to change a system to be a better system, and you got no hidden agenda pending any kind of disciplinary action to get back. You're not doing it to get back at them. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. For me, I was saving lives, and um, so fortunately, my case was such a high profile case. I had people like you in the public in the media support. I wasn't out there on an island like a lot of these whistleblowers that are from like big companies like Exxon or something and they get starved out. They don't have the media coverage and the big companies starve them out and they become penniless. I was very fortunate because of the, uh, the appeal of my story that I had the public and the good cops in the public uh, embrace me. But ironically, the ones that protected me, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious here, because I had to go back and work inside court and were the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Nuestra Familia, the Black Gorilla Family, the prison gangs put a protective circle around me and wouldn't let anything happen to me. Because if they didn't do that, I, would, I wouldn't be here today. Because I mean, they run, they run the prison system. You, you are literally that Arab proverb, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know, I mean, like they, they saw what you were doing and they are. They're held captive by this. How does it happen that and you guys should definitely watch the movie Felon. It, it's, a, it's a it's a good way to understand some of what we're talking about. But how does it happen that that this group gets together and gets turned into this murderous gang of guards? I mean, that's crazy. It's, it's an easy answer. Whenever you have anybody in any company, our military, anybody that is unpoliced by outside eyes, and basically we are the stamp of approval of each other, you're going to have corruption. If you don't have um, outside agencies looking in and kind of going in front of a review board when there's a use of force, um, we're going to we're going to give each other the stamp of approval every time. Yeah. But it's almost like the NFL with black coaches. God mm. forbid that gets out. God forbid one of those black coaches comes forward and tells what he went through, like just happened. Yeah. Now they're now they're all about let's hire black coaches. You know what I mean? But yeah. that that's been going on for 30, 30 years. Yeah. You know that that dog and pony show. So you got to have outside eyes on every aspect of Big Brother, whether it's our government whether it's our local judicial system or court system. And um, unfortunately, what I found out, Pete, is you deal with a lot of egos. The FBI has egos. The state investigators have egos. Our government has these. This person doesn't like this person. This person is going to embarrass this person. And you and you become just a small little fish in an ocean of sharks. Yeah. And, fortunately, and fortunately for me, um, I had some heavy politicians in California that were fighting for alternatives uh, from throwing an inmate away and locking him away, uh, throwing away the key for nonviolent inmates to find an alternative for prison that they backed me. And um, that was that was another way I was able to succeed. Um, a senator by the name of Richard Polanco, uh, he was one of the heads of the Democratic Party out of uh, Los Angeles. And Quentin Cobb, he's now a federal judge in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, Adam Schiff, Adam Schiff. Uh, I mean, I'm a Republican. I'm more of an independent now, but the Republicans were all about building more prisons. And uh, they wanted me to go away because I was exposing, you know, the big money maker, which was lock him up and throw away the key. And, um, you know, it, it's hard for me to say, but the Democrats, uh, they they stepped forward and they raised their hand for me. And uh, but, you know, everybody's got an agenda that's in the, that's in there. And my agenda was just to tell the truth, to right the wrong, to stop the violence, to uh, make changes in the Department of Corrections, 
that uh, change the hiring practice, psychological evaluations for new officers, extended the academy, changed the shooting policy. So changes all throughout the department was a result of what we did out at Corcoran State Prison. And um, I was just very fortunate to have good people like yourself, good police officers, good correctional officers um, embrace me. Because if I would have been abandoned, if I would have been abandoned emotionally by everybody, I don't know if I could have made it because it was a long road. You got to figure, I fought this fight from 1994 to 2000. So for six years, every day when I got in my vehicle, I didn't know if it was going to explode. So, it was, I mean, it was, it was hell on earth. And, uh, but fortunately, I was embraced by a lot of good people. Yeah. And I was very fortunate compared to a whistleblower that doesn't have the media exposure that I had. So my heart goes out to the guy that is working at uh, Google or wherever or Amazon. And he wants to expose them for, you know, discrimination or whatever. But people really don't want to hear the story. They don't care. They don't want to hear about Amazon. And uh, they basically run the guy out of his job, and basically he loses everything. I I was very blessed that that didn't happen to me. They tried. (laughs) I'm sure they did. Because you're also dealing with the union. And, uh, you know, you were no more powerful. The most powerful union in the state of California that gave the most contributions to to the governor which was Governor Wilson at the time. I mean, we had correctional officers in the late 80s making six figures. We were making more than CHP, California Highway Patrol. Yeah. And that was all because of the power of our union. Yeah, that's crazy. And if they want something to happen, boy, they've got some political clout. And, you know, um, yeah, you're in the union, but you're not part of it. And all of a sudden you get isolated. That can be dangerous. A lot I, of people- uh, there's, there's, a, there's a restaurant in Sacramento called Fats, and that's where all the politicians go. And I'll never forget, I had just testified in front of the California Senate, and I was with Senator Richard Polanco. He might be watching this, but I was with Senator Richard Polanco after I testified. He goes, come on, I want to take you out to dinner. So he takes me over to Fats, and that's where all the senators were eating. Well, as we walk in, we notice the head of my union – Don Novi sitting in the back. He had just heard my testimony. And Senator Polanco grabs my hand and walks me right over to his table. And he, and he says, Don, why don't you do something for this officer? He's one of your guys. And Don's face got all red, embarrassed, because he knew I was telling the truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? But um, And he looks up at me and he goes, Richard, what can I do for you? I said, Don, you know what you can do for me? Put me on the put me on the cover of the union magazine and let all the officers know in the state of California, what I'm doing is the right thing by coming forward and telling the truth. Yeah. And his face got, his face got real red. He knew, he knew, I, he knew I was telling the truth. Yeah. One of the things, cause there is a balance, right? So you got to do a hard job with dangerous people and you need to be able to tune somebody up from time to time. And you have rules of engagement for that. And having somebody from the outside assessing what you do often, look, I was in Baghdad, or I was in uh, Mosul, right? First part of the uh, Iraqi war. And right. we had a hard job. People were getting their heads chopped off every day in town. These are the Iraqis. We were getting mortared every day. This wasn't Cupcakeville, right? But um, the next unit came in and they started having things like best fucking lawn competition on the post. And this is not a post that this is, a, this is a serious working, operating combat you know, outcome. Right. And, you know, you have this problem where people who don't know, and, and these are logisticians running a camp, so they don't know any better, and they love to have, you know, salsa night. Meanwhile, you know, we're out, and listen, it's gray area where I'm at. Things that would never be legal now that I would never tell anybody about now because they were considered against the law had to happen at that time because we right. were in a lawless place. We were in a war, right? So when you have that outside set of eyes, it's real easy for things to get real dangerous for you all because you are dealing with people that sense weakness, that are looking for an opportunity, you know, or Absolutely. whatever. But talk about balancing that, that outside influence. Well, you know, there's a difference between a convict and an inmate, okay? An inmate will cry about anything, right? A convict that knows how to do time 
usually when he complains, there's something behind it. So a convict knows that if he touches staff or if he acts out towards staff, there's going to be severe repercussions. Okay. So basically I would always have the convicts and the guys that had a lot of time run the unit. You know, I know he's got probably a radio up in his cell. That's not his. I know that, you know what, he might have some tobacco. I, and he doesn't want me up in his cell. And, and so I would just communicate with him as, Hey, I want peace while I'm here. I want this unit to run accordingly. I'm not going to be all up in your business. I don't want anybody disrespecting any of the staff. And that's how I would manage them. I would let them manage themselves. Um, I remember one day I came into work, and uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the 415s. It's a gang out of the Bay Area by Oakland. And uh, I had the head of the 415s come up to me, and he said, uh, Caruso, can you take the gunner over to C-section? And I'm like, why? I, I go, what's going on? He goes, well, we had this young guy come in, this young uh, homeboy. He was a gang member, one of our gang members, and he disrespected one of the white guys the other day. And we're going to end up having a war in this building unless we talk to him. And I'm like, well, what does that mean you're going to talk to him? I go, you're not going to stick him. He goes, no, 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 we're going to talk to him. So I said, I said, Cliff, I said, you can't stick him. You can't do anything like that. He goes, I promise you that's not going to happen. So I called Jones. I said, hey, Jones, come over here. And the gunner's looking at me, and I hear scuffling on the other area of the unit, and all the white boys are looking over at those 415s, basically tuning that, ju that, that young punk up, taking care of their own business, cleaning their own house, and they're sending them a message that we got this. We're not going to tolerate the disrespect inside this unit between races. We got this. You don't have to do anything. And that was the politics. And so then the young uh, punk comes walking up to me with a bloody nose. And he goes, officer, I fell and hit the table. And I'm looking over at the white boys. I'm looking over at the 415s. I'm like, you sure nobody hit you? He yeah. goes, oh, no, nobody hit me. Nobody hit me. I said, okay, I'll take you over to uh, see the nurse. But that right there sent a message to that youngster that Caruso is using my homeboys to run this unit, and I need to act accordingly. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? It's like prison politics. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I, I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time here talking about, because race matters much more in prison than it does Everything. in the outside world, right? So let's talk a little bit why why people pick a side. And I was going to make a joke about the 415s being off-brand and should have changed over to the 510s, but I, you know, who cares about that stuff? But um, let's talk about race in prison and and why do different groups of people, well, you know, why is skin color a, a, a discriminator? Um, I, I just think that uh, that's what people, I mean, if they grow up in a neighborhood in which everybody's Italian or if everyone's Jewish or everyone's black or white, I think they gravitate towards their own mentality and values that they grew up with in that neighborhood. And many of them know each other's families. And so like I had, a, I had, I was working in Vacaville and I had this white boy roll up on the main line and he says, I'm a crip. I'm a crip from the crest. I said, uh, you, you're not housing with a crib. He goes, no, I want to, I want to house with a crib. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I go, if you house with a crib as a white boy, you're going to have problems. He goes, I'm not going to have any problems. I go, do you know how many sets of Crips they are? I go, just because your Vallejo Crips, your homeboys in Vallejo are going to embrace you, those uh, schoolyard Crips, those A-Trade gangsters, all those Crips in Los Angeles, they're going to bring pressure on you. He goes, no, I'll be good. I go, and when you come out, when you want that cell change, the white boys are not going to want you. He goes, I tell you, I want to sell with a Crip. I put him in with a Crip, and within a week, he was crying for a cell change. And it wasn't because of his celly. It was because of the other Crips said, we can't have this. And so the politics inside a prison, it's very race-based. And um, that's, I mean, that's just the way it is. As far as you'll, you'll see everybody getting along, you'll go on a yard with a thousand inmates. You'll see whites and blacks playing basketball together. And then the next day you come in and they'll all be wearing heavy jackets 
Whites will be over in one corner, blacks in one corner, Hispanics in another corner, and the hair on the back of your neck will stand up because you know the shit's about to go off. Yeah. And you start you start pulling over some of these inmates and patting them down, and they got that jean jacket on, and you pat them down, and you feel National Geographic magazines uh, are all up under their jacket, so when they get stabbed, they won't get stabbed and use it as a vest. You know the shit's about to kick. And... Uh, it happens like that. The uh, is it possible to be unaffiliated, even if you're like you know in in, in a felon, the dude isn't in a gang, you know, and ends up having to be in something almost from the moment the movie starts. He ends up right. in you know in with a group, and is it possible just to say, hey, I'm just I made a mistake. I'm trying to do my time. Leave me alone. Is that is that possible? Um, that was one of the things when we wrote Fallon because I helped write a lot of the prison scenes yeah. because the, the director had no idea about what's going on in prison. Um, you know, that was one of the things. How do we get this guy who created this crime protecting his family into the maximum security part of the inmate? So I had to create the whole scenario of the bus and he didn't snitch and, you know, which would get him into the shoe. And so to answer your question, um, if you, if you take that route and you're going to go out there solo on your own, what are you going to do when I come up into your cell and I say, Hey, it's going to cost you two soups, two soups every week to live on this tier. And you got no backup. It's just you. And as soon as you pay me those soups and show that weakness, the next week I'm going to come back for three soups. Mm. And then the next week I'm going to want four soups. And then the next month I'm going to, I'm going to bend you over your rack and you're going to be mine. So to answer your question, security comes with numbers and you almost need that protection of uh, you don't want to be a lone wolf because those predators will prey on you. The, the story is not impossible. I mean, what happens? I mean, his reason for going to, and, and the guy who, uh, Stephen Dorff is the uh, main character in terms of the inmate. And Val right. Kilmer does a great job of, of playing this uh, life, you know, lifetime kind of hard G O G guy. But it's not impossible that someone with a fairly normal life, heck, you know what? Matter of fact, from Vallejo, there was a guy who was breaking into homes. And this is an actual thing. Um, he breaks into a guy's home and that guy had been into some, into some trouble in his life too, right? which is not right. uncommon. I mean, a lot of people are arrested. And so the homeowner shot the intruder and they're like, Hey, yeah, you shot somebody, even though they were in your house, you could have de-escalated. And so he went to jail while the trial was going on. The intruder yeah. went out and broke into somebody else's house. Right. That, so, so these things really happen. And right. Well, that we, we wanted the viewer. We wanted yeah. someone like you, the viewer, to walk out of after watching Felon and say exactly that. That can happen to me. Mm -hmm. We wanted that. Yeah. Yeah. How did that go? I mean, I, I'd like to talk about the Hollywood part of the process because that's interesting to me too, and how your story went. What What ultimately is more dangerous, working in Hollywood or working in Corcoran? Uh, I mean, Hollywood, you know, for me, was not dangerous. It was uh, a lot of cutthroat stuff going on um, you with my story. So it's kind of, you know, it's not physically cutthroat, but it no, is. No, I mean, just, just you know, backstabbing, uh, people promising you things that they don't come through with. So uh, at first, Paramount Pictures had bought my rights to uh, make a movie. And uh, I thought, for, well, this is my first time dealing with Paramount Pictures. And I thought, you know, hey, we're going to make a movie based on my true life story. And a guy by the name of Mario Casar bought my rights. Well, he just shelled me for two years and did nothing. So then I got my life rights back. So then I, myself and my agent went down to Hollywood and basically went down to all the major studios. And we did the dog, the dog and pony show and put in 60 minutes that this is Richard's story. And Universal Studios bought my rights. And um, a guy by the name of uh, Casey Silver. And uh, he also assigned a screenwriter to come stay with me. And they paid him dearly to come and write a script. And the script was called Judgment. And so uh, I thought, actually, I go, this, this movie might get made. 
I'm like, wow, they're paying the screenwriter all this money. Uh, a guy by the name of David Chisholm. David is on my Facebook. And um, so then 9 11 happened. And instead of them Universal making my movie, Judgment, they made the movie uh, with J Lo called G Lee. And they made it, it sucked. And then they made Ladder 49. Then I got my rights back again, right? So then I moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And um, I'm uh, at Myrtle Beach, and there was a show called the Dan Abrams Report with Dan Abrams. And he was at the trial of Michael Jackson in Los Angeles. And the jury, the jury was out in the trial. And I was via satellite to the trial being interviewed by Dan Abrams because if Michael was found guilty, he was coming to where I had been inside of Corcoran Shoe in the high protective security housing unit. And I was telling, you know, Michael's probably watching this saying, I'm basically laying out what his day is going to be like if he's found guilty. Well, the next day, MSNBC got a hold of me and said, hey, there's a Hollywood director named Rick Waugh that uh, wants your phone number. Is it okay if we give it to him? When I, I'd already done the Hollywood thing. I'm like, you know what? I really don't care. It's never going to happen. The movie's never going to get made. And um, I said, you can give him my number, though. So he called me at my home. And he uh, he said, Richard, I want to make this film. You know, I'm excited about it. I remember your story from 60 Minutes. And I said, Rick, stop. I've heard all this pitch before. I said, do you already have funds? Are you, do you, are, have you been greenlighted by studio? And he said, no, not yet. I said, so basically you want my story and you're going to shop it. He goes, well, we're going to put a script together and then we're going to shop it. So at that point I knew, you know what, the movie still might not get made. I said, if you're that interested in my story, I go, you need to fly to Myrtle Beach. Within three days, he was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He showed up. He wanted my life rights. Um, basically offered me, I think, I think when Paramount Pictures bought my rights for two years, they gave me around $20,000 for two years. Yeah. Rick Waugh wanted my rights for $1. And I said it. I said, I handed him back the contract. And I said, hey, I appreciate you coming to Myrtle Beach. This is not happening. He goes, Richard, he goes, those people, Universal Studios, Paramount Pictures, they didn't make your movie. He goes, I'm going to make this movie. He goes, you get money on the back end. And I said, you know what? I said, um, I'm going to give this guy a try. So at that time, he pulled out of his briefcase probably 20 blank white index cards. And he laid them on the bed. And we started writing together on the index cards from an initial scene to a middle scene to an ending. So because the movie always has that initial hook. They take you up and then they let you down. And so we started writing about an unnamed prison movie on a, on a bed here in Myrtle beach, which was later going to be called felon. So a year after a year, for a whole year, two or three times a week, I would be on the phone late at night with Rick, the director, educating him about prison, educating him about my journey, educating him about Corcoran. And then about a year later, I get a phone call and they said, hey, Sony Pictures has just funded us. We got $4 million and we got A-list actors. I'm like, who are the actors? And they says, Val Kilmer, Sam Shepard, Ann Archer, Stephen Dorff, Nick Chinlin, Harold Perrineau. I'm like, wow. I said, they're going to do our movie for, I go, we're, we're, you know, we don't have that kind of a budget. And basically those actors got involved because they, they believed in the story. They appreciated the story and they came in and they crushed it. But as far as felon is based on my true story, but it's not my story that, um, what I went through. Yeah. It's based on incidents, and uh, a lot of the stuff was made up uh, for Hollywood. Right. But the violence, the violence, the infelon was the vi- was just a snippet of the violence at Corker State Prison. We at Corker State Prison, Pete, we had more violence and death than all the nation's prisons put together. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I remember that time. It, it was the, by the way, my buddy Dan, Dan White has been checking in. Dan, Dan is the ultimate uh, dude. He's like a 
you know, cop who's been a prison guard. He is like six eight, six nine, and like four hundred pounds. And so he shows up, and the room gets small. You know, <laughs> like and he's like, <laughs> and he ended up being one of the guys that would go into the prisons in in uh, his home state, and he put he put cuffs on guards and take them out. You know, like they would do the investigations. That is not a job that is appreciated by folks on the correction side of things. No. That's not easy. You know, and no. you can you you can take on a lot of heat for doing that. And you're what you're really trying to do is look, these guys are shitheads. Someone's got to do this job. And um ah, it's it's tough. I mean, look, I, as a counterintelligence guy, that's part of what I had to do too, is if someone was spying, my job was to go get them, you know. I don't tolerate dirty cops. I don't tolerate dirty employees. Uh, the majority of law enforcement officers out there are, have a tough, tough job. and They do an outstanding job. And God bless them for what they're dealing with now with all the pressure and microscopes on them. Um, my heart goes out to them because it's a tough job inside the prisons, work in the streets, our firefighters, our first responders. They're all heroes. They're all heroes to me. And unfortunately, there's always going to be bad apples. But what needs to happen is we don't need to, we shouldn't be covering for those bad apples. We need to get rid of them. We need to prosecute them. There has to be consequences. The public needs to see us policing ourselves and have confidence in us that we will, we will police them. We will get the bad apples out. But as far as the job itself, all those people are heroes to me. All of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible to be, you know, a hero and then also be in a place that's exceptionally challenging to work in. And, and um, you know, it's, yeah, it is a hard situation. And I want to make sure we're fair about that. Let's, let's talk about you over there in a foreign land and some of the stuff that you saw over there. Now, you say you can't talk about it, but yeah. what if it was, a, what if it was a fork in the road and the guy that was with you put a bullet in one of the kids' heads or something like that? Would you be? Would you come forward to your command and say, "I can't be a part of this," or would you just go along with it? It's a really hard question, and I've exactly seen, I've seen some things, and I think this is a, this is a fair way to answer this. I have seen some things that are un, un, uncomfortable for me in terms of how people did things. Maybe they crossed the line. Maybe it wasn't the line. But what did you do? Them. Well, you know, you got to go on patrol with that person the next day. You, I had to go to work with them the next day. I depended on them. But when you meet your maker, yeah, are you going to have a clean conscience that you could have preserved or you could have stopped that? Are yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't have a good answer for you because some of these things in a different scenario might be okay. You know, um, look, torture. Torture looks like a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and you see stuff you're like you know. And I would say to these yeah, some of these guys that I worked with, I'm like let me work with some of these guys and talk to them and see if I can't get them to open up, you know, because look, you hand, is it any better to hand them to the Iraqis when you know the Iraqis are going to hit them with a shovel in the head? Well, this is the way I look at that is my daughter has got 15 years in the air force. She's a master sergeant and God forbid she was taken hostage. Yeah. And if our government called me and said, listen, you know what? We're going to be borderline interrogating uh, some of these guys that we get, I'd say cut each finger off one by one, get my daughter back. I torture wouldn't even come into play. I don't care how they get my daughter back. You do what you got to do, but can you stay within that scope and not in that gray area and not go from torture to now you're raping their wife or you're, you're shooting the family. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to a doctor, a friend of mine, and uh, we were out to dinner and I said, cause he was talking about my story and he thought it was very courageous and stuff. And I said, I said, doc, I said, listen, I said, what about you're in the operating room? You're, you're doing surgery on an 85 year old man. The next six months of his life is not going to be good. And you're working with another doctor who's known, he knows the circumstances and he basically puts this man to sleep with honor. Yeah. And you know he's putting him to sleep on that table instead of going out and asking the family, is this the right thing to do? Yeah. I said, would you I said, would you stop that? Would you tell the hospital on that doctor? 
He goes, Richard, I would never be able to work in another hospital. He goes, I wouldn't say anything. He goes, it happens all the time. And I said, well, who is that doctor to play God? Yeah. I said, as a family member, I would want to say, yes, it's okay to put it, to let him go or no, I want my father here for six more months. So it's just like you. I mean, there's, there's a gray area dealing in law enforcement dealing and you have to kind of um, function within that gray area. And like you said earlier, a lot of these gang members, all they understand is fear. Yeah. And if they don't fear you, you are going to become prey and they're going to be the predator. But when you, when, when they fear you, I'm not just going to say gang members, just society. If we don't fear getting a ticket going 65 into 55, we're going to go 75. Yeah. So we have to govern, unfortunately, with fear, the fear being consequences. But when we get into those consequences, you know, what is that gray area? Some of us can work within that gray area. Others take it way too far. And that's the problem that I have, the ones that take it way too far. And I will say this, too, in terms of like you, the, you asked me the very fair and very tough question about, you know, what's too much and when would you stand up? You're also in an active combat environment and the person you're talking to either probably or has been the person who's blowing up your friends or one deployment before. You have no idea what even happens, but you know that these guys have been actively operating in a lethal environment and and hunting lives. Right. And so right. it gets really like it gets really, really muddy, but it doesn't make it right to. What's the line in the sand for you, Pete? What's the line? Answer the question. Where would you say enough? Um, yeah, if I was present for an interrogation and it they weren't playing with the rules. So first off, there's one time when I saw something and it wasn't over the line in terms of what Pete thought, right? I'm sure that dude thought it was, but that's, he didn't really have a vote, but I definitely made a point to say, let's not put people in this situation where we're doing this right around the time of Abu Ghraib, right? And so I, I said, let's, let's not put people in that position. Let's, let's like leave no doubt that we're doing the right thing because look, people have gotten in trouble for this sort of thing. And I don't want to say too much about it, but it wasn't an action, but I sought to correct what I saw to be a dangerous pattern. And I didn't want us to go over it because once you compromise that, it takes people with you. And 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 to illustrate, on, on another camp I lived on, there were guys who were running guns and running women. And that whole thing came apart. And one of those dudes shot himself in the head on the American camp, right? He's an American now. Everybody right. is an American. And, right. and so this is the kind of thing where, you know, the line goes from, hey, we're just going to sell some weapons, no one cares, to... Now we're doing women and now you get caught and now all of a sudden there's lethal consequences because that could be that dude turning his gun on somebody else too and, and doing a, who knows what, right? Cause they're, they're right. desperate, you know? So yeah, I mean the line, the line moves, it's tough and, but that's combat. Combat's really tough to sort out because people are dying every day and you don't know the consequences. I've absolutely dropped off a source in town. And, and made it known that that guy was talking to the Americans, to the locals around there. Never saw that guy again. Don't know if he died. Don't know if he lived. Don't know if he just took the message and got the hell out of there. But our intention was to terminate that relationship. This is a term on the books, too. Terminate it with, with malice, right? We terminated that relationship with malice. And if that means that that guy dies and because he was trying to run us. You're playing a lethal game at that point. Is that over the line? I don't think so. But... Is right by the line, you know. Like you might have one foot on the uh, balancing on the line, and the other one good. But it's, what, if, uh, what, what, what if you and I are on a patrol, and uh, for some, some something happens to where I sexually assault a female in the village? Would you would you go back and report me, or would you keep your mouth shut? You know, uh, let me back up. One of the things they wanted us to do was to report when we saw child abuse from like the Afghans or Iraqis or whatever. And um, no, you cannot report that because that is out in the big world. And if things happen out there because of that, you're putting entire you're putting units after you. You're putting a lot of people at risk over something you have no business controlling. Because would not you confront me? Would you confront me on it? 
and tell me you are was in house. Yes, I think I would confront you. That would be my intention because again, you're putting all of us at risk. But but me in the position I was in, I would probably jump several several uh, rungs in the ladder and say, I have seen something that has exactly. to stop. You know, and that's what I did. Yeah, that's no, exactly that's the problem with what you did. Right? Yeah, and it ain't easy. It ain't easy. I'll, no. say, I'll give you a real life example. PFC Manning, uh, if you recall, uh, used to be known as Bradley Manning. I don't know uh, her first name now, but anyhow, was in the unit that I was in. I was supporting. I was there as a civilian. And he worked, and I'm saying he because that's what he was at the time. He worked in the two shop. I worked just across the hall. And if he, he obviously had this crisis of conscience. He was seeing things that were wrong. And if he had reached out and said, hey, Mr. Turner, can we can we go get lunch? I want to talk to you. And if he had bared his soul to me, I don't know that I would have had good advice for him because what he did was wrong, but what he did was right. All right he blows a whistle and ultimately goes to jail for it, he gets pardoned because what he did was wrong, but also what was happening was wrong. And another guy, Peter Van Buren, was in the same building as me, and we both kind of agree, like, I don't know what I would have told him because – the system didn't want to hear that message. Right. The system would have shot that down and it would have gone nowhere. But because of how it happened, you know, it checked up. And, and what the State Department was doing was legitimately getting veterans or warriors killed actively because they were so dismissive of the Iraqi partners, among other things. Right. So is that bad or good? I don't know. These things aren't easy. That, But that's the gray area. And in prison, right. in prison, I was fine with the gray area because I knew it needed to exist. But when others were taking it to life or death, taking a life unjustly, I couldn't be a part of that. And yeah. I, and I wouldn't be a part of that. So I had to yeah. stop it. I had to stop it. And, um, but that gray area has to exist. It has yeah. to exist. Yeah. Yeah. And those dudes that I know that, that absolutely love um, killing people, you know, cause that is their profession. And, they default to it too much for me to be comfortable, but we're in a place where people need killing and get killed, even if it's accidental. And so that line is really tough to measure out. You start saying, hey, this guy just loves killing people a little bit too much. It's You're not going to be long in that career. It's like your doctor. It's like you won't be working in a hospital because am I right? Am I the arbiter of justice? I don't know because, again, it's a very, very hard thing. Uh, but if you're in a, I suppose if you're in a jail cell and, or, you know, in, in the shoe or somewhere like that, and you see someone who craves the violence, craves harm, hurting people, abuses their power, um, doesn't deescalate when there's opportunity to. And I'm not saying you have to always deescalate. Sometimes you can't. And sometimes you can't fault that person for escalating. And you're like, oh, you could have done this because that's not fair. When you're in that moment, you're in that person, you fear for your life or the safety of others. However, there is a difference and there is a line somewhere out there where you crave hurting people. And right. it's happened too many times. And look, I know you're processing it, but you enjoy it too much. I would definitely have to say something about that. You know, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. when I did see a line, I was working temp jobs for a startup company. And they're like, hey, we really got to hunker down. We really got to make a bunch of phone calls. We really got to make some sales. What is it going to take to get you to do that? And I'm like, well, I just need more money. I mean, I just pay me more money, you know? And they're like, how about some, you know, some Molly? And I'm like, yeah, you don't get to offer people drugs in the professional workplace. That's not, so I had to tell on that guy, you know, because that for me was a line I was ready to cross. So I, that's not, you know, I don't know where the line always is, man, but I know where it is for me. And hopefully I have the courage to act on it when I see it. For me, the line is what's going to keep me awake at night. Yeah. And taking another human being's life that didn't have it coming yeah. is gonna is gonna keep me awake at night because someday if I if I get up there, um, I'm gonna have to answer that question of why I did that, knowing the person didn't have it coming. Now I'm not I'm not weak on crime. I mean I I believe an eye for an eye, but that's not the way the system is. And uh, uh, but um, there has to be consequences uh for bad behavior and there has to be deterrence for certain crimes whether it's a death penalty whether it's um so many years in prison 
Yeah. But when you get into a situation where you're locking up a nonviolent drug offender for 25 years and you're letting out a murderer in 18, yeah. to me, there's a problem there. Yeah, yeah. I struggle with the death penalty because we know we've put innocent people to, to death. But there was a maybe ten years ago there was there were two cases where they were going to put two dudes to death the same night, and one of them it was like you know gray area should we put this person to death? There was vigils. The other one hooked up a black dude to the back of his truck and drug him to death, and nobody yeah. had a problem with that guy dying. You know, so there is an area, but I, I don't like to lean on it because we we shouldn't be putting people to death. And we know that we've made wrongful convictions on stuff. I'm curious what you think about Cain Velasquez, who went out and did what every parent says they're going to do. You know, someone touches somebody very close to him, a child in his family. And he goes out and is like, I'm going to go kill you. And uh, he shoots the wrong dude. He, you know, does harm the other guy. And now he's in prison without bail. I mean, here, here's you're talking movie. about the, fi the fighter, the yeah, fighter, right? Yeah. yeah. Here's your movie being played out right here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my heart goes out to him because I, I hear what you just said about what you would do yeah. about the death penalty. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, if you had a child and you had someone hurt that child or kill that child, like Kane, yeah, um, your your opinion about the death penalty and the reaper or what should happen to that individual that just killed your daughter, raped her, yeah. and left her out there on the freeway. Um, it might, I think that, that your opinion might change, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, unfortunately, I've seen people get out of prison that didn't deserve to get out of prison, and I've seen people incarcerated, uh, yeah. that were that were political prisoners. I mean, I had Sirhan Sirhan, Sirhan Sirhan killed Bobby Kennedy. I mean, if you look at the case, you know, he had a revolver with six shots, I think they yeah. found eight, I think they found eight bullets. And really um, weird case. Yeah. it's a really weird case. And he's been a model prisoner for like 40 years. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going to let out a murderer that killed somebody in the neighborhood after 18 years, should a, someone's last name Kennedy make a difference of you're going to put this person away. That's been a, a model prisoner for 40 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, if you would have killed me or you, you'd have been out on the street by now. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, and, I, do we need a 77 year old man locked up behind bars for doing, look, it's a horrible crime, but are we serving the greater good of humanity by having him in bar, behind bars? Pete, the bottom line is you have to install hope in these young men that are still impressionable that when they get that X on them, that's a felony. If it's a nonviolent felony, Give them some kind of out. Don't back them in a corner and say your life's over now because you got a felony. Yeah. Give them, give them an option and say, hey, listen, we have this program in Nebraska. It's a trade school for eight months. If you go there, you're disciplinary free. You get your certificate of welding or whatever. You come out. We'll take that nonviolent fel felony and we'll knock it down to a misdemeanor and give them hope. When you take hope away, you take hope away from anybody. They're dangerous. And they don't care. One of the other things I learned from the Prison Chronicles, and I, th I think, you know, and we don't have to go a whole lot more, but I, I, that's just such an important thing. And Shaka Sangoro said this, but this was echoed by the other guys. The, um, the default is all prisoners are rehabilitatable. You just start there. And if you're going to fail, you fail on that side of the problem. And you treat it like, hey, how do we, how do we get this person as close as we can to being a viable taxpaying member of society and re-enter them? as opposed to this broken system with recidivism and all that kind of thing. I don't agree that all prisoners are rehabilitatable. When you're dealing with someone like Juan Corona that killed, yeah. I think like 20 some immigrant workers cut their heads off with machete. He yeah. was in my unit. He was in my unit. There's no rehabilitating that evil. That's evil. And uh, yeah. I I'm talking about nonviolent uh, criminals that get warehoused in state prison yeah. because of a nonviolent crime. But, but I, um, I think he would agree with you. We don't want Ramon Salcedo walking around free. We don't want that. And no. and and uh cuz he did horrible things. Um one of the things that he would say, he's like, you know, so who do you think? Of? You think about Charles Manson. He's like, how many people did he kill the last 50 years of his life? And you're like, well none. 
you know, because he was locked up. He's like, so maybe he needs to be locked up in some way. But if you focus on rehabilitation as the norm, you're allowed to push the few people off and say, these people are criminally insane. They're not allowed to reenter. Instead of just starting with like, if you come in, look, the, um, the fact of the matter is all of the prison systems, all the prisons in California have less rehabilitation options than San Quentin does by itself. And that's because it's right there by the billionaires. It's right there close. They can commute to, you know, if you live in, if you're, if you're incarcerated in Pelican Bay or fucking Susanville, where you have to leave the state of California to get to it. Right. There's, there's no help there, right? Not, right? not like there is in San Quentin. So we've got to get better at rehabilitating. I think that's Pete, it. I, I had a I had an inmate, uh, a black guy. He was late 60s. He had done 25 years in prison in California. Yeah. We were we were taking him to the train station. We had him in the van. He was getting out. We had his $200 gate money. We we're going to give him his ticket to go to Los Angeles. We take him to the train station down in Corcoran. Huh. Guess what happens? We open the door. He's still got handcuffs on. He starts running. Oh, God. And we tackle him. And we're like, what the hell are you doing? Now he's going to get charged for escape. Because he has not been released yet. Yeah. He, said, he said, I don't want to go home. He goes, I'm a nobody out here. He goes, I'm a somebody behind those walls. He goes, it's too hard out here in this world. Yeah. And he, he didn't want to come out. He didn't want to get out. Yeah. People become so institutionalized. But what does that say about our society? And, and the, it goes back to the family unit. Yeah. Think of yeah. these individuals that didn't have a good family. And yeah. now I'm not trying to be a sympathizer, right. but it starts in the there home. Is a, there is a cause here with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about that whole thing, too, is we release someone with 200 or so dollars. That's not – look, and they've been there for 25 years. Are you telling me that that's all the money that, that we could put together? Like, this guy works. You know, we can do a way better job of creating a ramp. Where, and you're putting them back into the drug-infested environment yeah, he came yeah. out of. And, and Don't saying, hang out with your friends. <laughs> Don't break the law. Here's 200 bucks. You know? We know he's coming back. We know yeah, he's coming right, back. right, right. I mean, that's one of the uh, great things about San Quentin is they have that job where these uh, inmates learn how to code and they can work on contracts on actual live coding projects. And it's one of the the lady who runs the pro or well, she used to run the project at San Quentin. She said it's the most healthy work environment she'd ever been in. This included any all the companies she'd work in on the outside because these guys were well adjusted. They had worked on their problems because they don't just give us to people on their first day. You know, you've got to you've got to prove that you're worthy of doing it. And now they're making industry standard wages for the work that they're doing. So when they, they can provide for their family, they can have a little bit of money when they get out. Heck, maybe have a down payment on a house if they're there long enough. But they're able to do something and have this hope that we're talking about. You, well, you just said the key word, hope. Yeah, yeah. you got to give them hope. If you take someone's hope away, they're, 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 they're dangerous. Dangerous people. Hey, so here's my question to you now. I'm going to go back to the Hollywood thing. I know that there was more than one movie in you. We talked about this before. Any chance any of these other projects ever get made? Well, I mean, I, my agent that I had passed away. And um, if I have another agent that wants to shot my story, because um, I, was, I was talking to a well-known author, and she, I won't mention her name, but uh, she want, she said, Richard, your story was in the late nineties and you know, what about the relevance? It's 2020. I said, the relevance, the oh relevance of it's, it's more relevant today than it was back then about ethics and law enforcement, doing the right thing, um, breaking the code of silence. Uh, I mean, it's so if someone took my story or if I got an agent and they wanted to go out in LA and shop and I would be, I would definitely be interested if they wanted to do that. Um, it's a compelling story yeah. of uh, with the FBI being just as dirty as the state of California. And that's what felon doesn't tell you is uh, felon takes you down a road of the inmates uh, girlfriend going to the FBI when it was me being chased by the state investigators you know, take it out in a cotton field in Hanford to a payphone where I thought I was going to be shot. You know, so um, it's, it's very nowhere for anybody who doesn't know. 
You get shot exactly. out there, it's going to take a minute for anybody to even know. Exactly. And uh, so, I mean, if, if there was an interest, I would definitely be uh, interested in talking to the individual. I know you have a lot of people in the entertainment business that you've uh, interviewed on yeah. your podcast. And uh, if you, if someone sees it or you want to connect a dot, I would definitely be open to uh, talking with them. But um, my whole thing is, making a difference that one person, you know, sees my story and says, you know what, I would do the right thing. Yeah. I would do the right thing or making change in the department in which I did by, uh, by the things that have changed. I talked about uh, shooting uh, policy was changed, extending the academy, um, psychological evaluations now for new hires. All that was because the focus in the yeah. microscope was put on the Department of Corrections. But um, it's, uh, you know, we, we want to think that one man or, you know, a couple people can't make a difference. But I'm here to tell you that, you know, myself and my lieutenant, Steve Rigg, and uh, there was, uh, there was a, a couple of us that we stood tall for many years and we brought the Department of Corrections to their knees. And we didn't know if the day, every day we woke up was going to be our last day but we stood fast with the truth and we saved a lot of lives out there in California. Well, man, you're a hero. We, we appreciate it. And you're right. Yeah. We need a, we need more folks like that. And I'm not a hero. I'm, the heroes are the ones out there on, doing the job. It's my show. No, the, hero, the, the, show the, hero. <laughs> the heroes are the ones doing the job. Now the police officers, the firefighter, the nurse, the doctors, the correctional officers, those are my heroes. The military, you sir, you raise your right hand to serve this country, you're a hero to me. I've, I've, I've done it. I've been there. And I'm fortunate to be able to be matched in amongst men like yourself and others that have served. And that's what I do now is I travel the country and I honor those who serve our communities, who serve our country. I grab them. I put my arm around them and I tell them they still mean something to me. And their service means something to me. And I leave them better off than when I left them. Stand by for one sec. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. And right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by...